Grace and peace. Welcome to Christ Community Church. Today we continue our series entitled Practices for Life. We have been looking at some virtues that make love possible. If you remember, we've talked about love, forgiveness, gratitude, empathy, and today we are going to talk about stillness or perhaps we want to say awareness or maybe even learning to live in the moment. All of these virtues that we've been discussing are really designed to help us grow in love. They make love possible. So here is the text that I want to read today. It's found in Psalm 46, verse 10. This will really just be a launching point for our subject matter today. Psalm 46, 10 states, Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. Another translation reads, Cease striving and know that I am God. Would you please pray with me? Father, we open up our lives to you today. We pray that uh, you will help us to hear what we need to hear so that we might live the way that you want us to live. We are your servants and we are truly grateful for the life and the new life that you have bestowed upon us. Help us now as we listen and help us to be here in this moment. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. It goes without saying that right now we live in a world of constant distraction, a world that makes it difficult for us to really be in the moment, to be present to God and to others, we might even say. Unlike any other time in the history of civilization, our lives are noisier than ever before with the potential for constant distraction. Think about what we have at home right now. At home, we have screens, multiple screens, in fact, with endless options for consumption. We have Netflix, HBO, Amazon Prime, NBC, ABC, CNN, ESPN, Fox News, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, just to name a few. We also have access to every cat video in the world right now, waiting for our consumption. Now think about it. It wasn't terribly long ago that we only had a few network channels, ABC, NBC, CBS, and then PBS. And we only had a few shows to follow, like Happy Days, Eight is Enough, Brady Bunch, just a few shows to follow, and you could never binge watch. You had to wait an entire week for the next episode to come out. And then during the summer, we didn't have anything to watch. We only had reruns to watch in the summer. Nothing new to watch in the summer. And now the list is endless, and it is waiting for our consumption um, anytime we are awake. Now, these options can create distractions for us, constant distractions. Psychologists have pointed out that just the thought of these opportunities are really distracting. If you place a phone on a table, let's say, during dinner your mind will experience this tug to check that phone. That that argument on Facebook or whatever you want to check on Instagram is probably much more exciting than having to listen right now to your family. Uh, the engineers that work for social media and that design these programs are designing them intentionally to be addictive. It is designed, these programs are designed on the premise of a slot machine. You've probably heard this. And it's no surprise that some of the labs that work on these programs are called dopamine labs. So these programs like Instagram, Facebook, they are designed to be addictive. And so we feel this tug constantly to check what is happening on our screens. On top of these distractions, we could mention children's activities today. Children's activities have blossomed. Travel teams for every sport, music lessons, SAT uh, training, tutoring for classes, AP classes. And without some intentionality, you can find yourselves overly committed. You can find yourself swamped with activities for your children. And no matter how much you do for your children, you still might find find yourself guilty because there are more opportunities that you are not yet taking advantage of. I know that's where Angie and I struggled when we had children um, in this area, trying to, to make sure we lived our lives intentionally, but it was difficult. Then we could just add the complexity of our world right now, Projects are complex, government is complex, politics is complex, 
everything is complex and this complexity requires more thoughts, more thoughts, more distraction, and maybe even more anxiety in our lives. All of this to say that we can be easily distracted from the present moment. And truth be told, we might even be overwhelmed right now. We might be overwhelmed, drowning in a sea of distraction and not even know that we are drowning because it's what we've become so accustomed to. We are overwhelmed perhaps, maybe not, but overwhelmed perhaps with a, a, a world of distraction that keeps us from being in the moment when we need to be in the moment. Now, the reason I'm concerned about constantly being distracted from the present moment is because of this need to be aware. I don't know exactly what to call it today, but I want to say we need to be aware or to be still or to be quiet so that we can be in the present moment. I mean, doesn't it go without saying that if we are going to attend to our inner life, if we are going to be concerned about our character, then part of what that requires is that we learn to be aware. If we stand any chance of growing in love, then we need to learn to be still, to be aware, to be quiet, so that we can then learn to be in the present moment when we need to be in the present moment. Consider a couple examples from Scripture. I, I really believe that Scripture doesn't necessarily speak directly to this issue, but it does point us in this direction. So a couple of examples from scripture. I, I've been thinking about the parable of the sower and the seeds. It's one of the most familiar parables. Um, and I just want to read the last two verses as they come to us from Luke's gospel. Jesus says this, The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. That line always gets me. Uh, that line always gets me. There is some seed that falls on good soil, but the plants do not mature because they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. And could we add distractions to that? Um, and then verse 15, the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by preserving, producing a crop. Now, Jesus really wants to emphasize this point. I love how it comes to us in Luke's gospel. The good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and hold on to it by perseverance. There's an endurance involved, and they produce a good crop. And then a few verses later, Jesus says, Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Because whoever has more will be given, and whoever does not have even what they think they have will be taken from them. You know how to interpret this already because I've talked about it in the past. Whoever has good listening skills, whoever has good ears, they will receive more. But whoever does not have good listening skills, those who don't have good ears, you might say, even what they think they have will be taken from them. The point I'm trying to make is that if we want to listen well, then we need to be present on occasion. You can't be constantly waiting for this moment to end so that you can move on to something else more exciting. You can't be anxiously waiting for this to conclude so that you can follow up on that Facebook argument. A quiet mind and a still heart are essential to listening well. Because to listen well, you have to be able to be here now, to really think, to ponder, to face yourself, to hear what needs to be heard. You have to be aware and attentive. Another interesting example that I find really intriguing is found in Exodus chapter 3. So another example of from Scripture. Now, this is an important chapter. You're probably familiar with it. In Exodus 3, Moses receives the call to lead Israel out of Egypt. Yet here's where it all starts. It starts with God noticing that Moses notices. God sees that Moses sees. God is aware that Moses is aware. Are you familiar with it? The verse says this, When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, that is to look at the burning bush, 
God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. It's almost like a test. God notices that Moses notices. God sees that Moses is aware. And then God calls him from the, the, the bush. Again, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're in a hurry, you might say, well, that's odd. I, I got to go. If you're cynical about everything, you might just say, oh, that's weird. I got you know better things to do. I've got this shiny object I need to attend to. But Moses is not in a hurry and he is not cynical. He is available. He notices and pauses and God sees that he sees and God speaks and Moses says, here am I. It's a beautiful moment of scripture. You see the ability to be present when necessary, is foundational for our growth in grace, to grow in love. Now, this is not some sort of legalism. You have to do this in order to be saved, but we're talking about an invitation to consider maybe what we can do to grow more deeply into the God that loves us and to participate in that love. And what's required, again, is to be somewhat aware available. Now, again, let me highlight the struggle. The struggle is intense right now. It is difficult. It is probably harder than any other time in the history of civilization to be in the moment and to have quiet minds. As I said earlier, everything is complex. Projects are complex in the modern world. Government is complex. There's red tape. There's bureaucracy. And this complexity creates more demands upon the human mind. I also implied earlier that there are countless options for entertainment, and these are not evil in and of themselves, but, but they just are what they are, with sports and shows and, and a Twitter feed and a Facebook argument. We, we just feel like we might be missing something really important um, rather than just being in the moment. And as I pl- implied earlier, if you're raising children in this area, you might feel this tug, this guilt that you're not doing enough, even though you are doing a lot. And you keep doing more and more and, until the point you don't have any margin in your life. All of this creates noise and stress. Here's the way my wife and I talk about it. We talk about it in terms of being in our heads. So when my wife and I are struggling with a thought that we can't get let go some sort of dilemma that we just allow, you know, keep allowing it to, to circle in our head and etch kind of a, a little uh, channel in our brain. Um, what we say is, I'm all up in my head. I, I'm all up in my head right now. And what we mean by that is we're not able to be in the moment. We're not living in our bodies. We're not living you know, in this present time, but we're living in regret or we're living in fear of the future and it has become all consuming. And so I recognize the battle to be all up in our head. So what is necessary for us is to begin to practice an awareness, a stillness, so that we can be present when necessary. Now, the Christian church has been talking about this for quite some time. In the earliest days of the church, the great spiritual leaders praised the value of silence and solitude. Um, They they talked about this need to get away from the crowd, to face ourselves, and to face God. I mean, after all, Jesus worked fairly hard to get away from the crowds. You really see this in Luke's gospel. Just read through and notice the number of times that Jesus is working fairly hard to get away from the crowds for silence and solitude. Now, the reason this became important is because it's in silence and solitude that you're forced to face yourself. You can't run from your demons anymore. You can't run from that anger or that hurt. You can't run from your sins anymore. You have to face them and ask God to help you with them. Also, it's in silence and solitude that you learn to be present before God and to know that he is God. You learn to rest in the presence of God. Uh, Quickly glossing over this, uh, I also want to point out that in the Christian church, there was also an emphasis on contemplation. 
And it was this idea that as we studied scripture, as we f- reflected upon scripture, we would meditate upon it, like Psalm 1 talks about, to meditate upon the law of God. But sometimes what would happen is that meditation would morph into a quietness, a stillness, a resting in the presence of God. Now, here's what I find interesting about our contemporary culture. Psychologists are now recognizing the value of this tradition. Psychologists are discovering that this type of prayer, that this type of meditation changes the structure of the brain. What psychologists are calling it is mindfulness, learning to be in the moment. And I I really believe there's some overlap here. I might be wrong. Um, But I really believe there is an overlap here between this mindfulness and this being still that I'm describing. Here's one way we could look at it. We could compare it to exercise. If you think about exercise right now, exercise doesn't necessarily make you a more loving person. Exercise does not necessarily make you a, a, a more patient person. There's not like this direct link. But there is an indirect link. In this way, exercise reduces our stress. It helps us feel stronger and better. And therefore, we are more capable of being attentive to God and to others. This is one of the main reasons I like to run. It helps me with my prayer life because I'm more alert and wake, awake and, and more able to be attentive to God and to others. The same could be said of, of practicing stillness in our world. Maybe in our chaotic world, this is more important than ever before because learning to be still, practicing it, makes our minds ready to receive. It can help us grow in grace. I, 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 it's kind of like clearing the ground, pulling out the weeds, making the soil ready to receive, you might say. I appreciate the words of a 17th century St. Francis de Sales. Um, He gave some advice to a lady who came to him for spiritual direction. And he said, I will start giving you spiritual direction when you have begun to walk, walk more slowly, talk more slowly, and eat more slowly. In other words, you've got to slow down. And then we will start. We need to clear the ground a little bit. And then we will begin to work on spiritual direction. So that is the need. And, and then the question is, is we've you know, always moved in this direction in this series. How, how do we get there? What practices can we embrace? Let me mention three very quickly. And again, this is, this is just something I want you to consider. It's an invitation, um, but it's not a... A have to. This is not law or anything like that, but just an invitation to maybe begin to flourish in life and flourish in God's love. So number one um, is practice stillness. No surprise there. So if you already have a prayer life and it does not consist of learning to be quiet every now and then and be still before God, I would invite you to add that component. If you don't have a prayer life, This is a great way to begin to sit still and be in the moment and try it for five minutes. The Christian church has suggested, uh, you know, a a simple breath prayer like, Lord, make haste to help me or God help or or help me to be here now. Um, Just a simple prayer to quiet yourself and to be in the presence of God and to be in the present moment. Um, And when you have an unwanted thought, you just gently let it go, and you return to being attentive to the present presence of God. And, And just try it for a month, let's say, three times a week, five minutes a day, and and if it grows, great. Um, I like this quote that moves us in this direction from... David Adam, who is wrote a book on Celtic spirituality that I, I love, um, had to buy it from a bookstore in England. They don't print it anymore. But he says, daily prayer is not so much words, but awareness. Not so much a telling God, but a being with him. 
with all our senses alert to what God desires of us. Prayer is an, an, is an entering fully into the eternal that is all about us. What a great line. What a great line. And really what we're after here is the ability to regain control of our thoughts, to be still and quiet, attentive to the moment, and then you will be better equipped to be quiet and attentive to others. Second thing I would say is an awe walk. That's a difficult thing for me to say for some reason. A-W-E, walk. So walking with a sense of wonder, a sense of awe, slowly, deliberately. I landed on this accidentally. It was a stressful time for me. I was wrestling with this dilemma. I was at Pete's on my day off. I couldn't calm my thoughts. My mind was out of control. So I went for this walk and I, I just started to walk slowly, as slowly as I could. And I noticed the trees, the hills. I didn't have an agenda. I noticed the ground and the dirt and I started to be thankful for life. And I just tried to pay attention to be in the moment. And I still practice that on my days off occasionally. I just go for this slow, deliberate walk to be in the moment. Number three, and again, these aren't laws, I, 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 but just another option here. Consider limiting your screen time or be very intentional about your screen time, we might say. Take a night off from media. Take a day off from media. Um, don't use the phone on a certain night or shut the phone down at 8.30, wh whatever it might be. There's no, there's no formula here, but, but let's maybe consider being a little more intentional about how we use our screens. Because if we want to grow in grace, if we want to love well, we have to wrestle with this aspect of learning to be still and present. And just the effort is transforming. Even if it's frustrating, just the effort is transforming. We need to practice being present in this moment with these people before God. As Richard Rohr says, we cannot attain the presence of God. We are already in the presence of God. What's lacking is awareness. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, bless us, forgive us, and heal us. We open up our lives to you. And we pray you will draw us deeper into the fellowship of your communion of love. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you on Zoom at 11 a.m. May the Lord bless you.